It's time to hear the view from the school right now. The next, the next piece is about building resilience. It's one school's story of putting well-being at the heart of learning. From Burnside Primary in Canoosey in Angus, Scotland, please welcome head teacher Nikki Murray. Good afternoon. One of my favourite films is Goodwill Hunting, because it's a story about trauma, attachment, adverse experience, and it's about a boy who is in and out of care. He's living in deprivation in the poorest part of Southie in Boston. And it was a significant relationship that the two main characters had in navigating the complex fields of trauma, adversity, and care experience that resonated with me long before I actually got into the world of teaching. And there's actually a quote in the film that I'll share, which says, liberty is a soul's right to breathe, and when it cannot take a long breath, then the law is girdled too tight. And I would replace the word law for another word. Liberty is a soul's right to breathe, and when it cannot take a long breath, education is girdled too tightly. And when that happens, we have a moral responsibility to protect that liberty at all costs. We protect that liberty by prioritizing the learning, the learning that comes by reading the best that's been said, thought, and written, and doing something with it to improve the outcomes for the families in the communities in which we live, work, and serve. And so, there's a famous quote by an Irish poet Seamus Heaney, who says, if you can find the words, you can find your way through anything. And so we went in search of the words, and we found them. In Palestine, from Professor Art Wani, who'd been commissioned to write a report called An Agenda for Change, Health Matters. And in that report, it talks about children, children generating well-being outcomes for themselves. And our role as professionals and parents is to support those children to unfold the capacities much like a flower unfolds in the warmth of the sun. So that became our mission, to find ways that we could create opportunities for children to generate well-being. And the results have been significant. This was a quote from Her Majesty's Inspectorate who came to our school in Carnoustie in May. The report was published in June and the report was absolutely outstanding. They have rated our school as one of the best performing primary schools in the whole country with two sector leading performances, one in well-being, inclusion and equality. And what they've written up there doesn't happen by default. Children don't come to school with such determination, such commitment, and such a sense of well-being. We have over 500 children in my primary school, and that includes a very large nursery. We've done a huge amount of professional learning around resilience, and lots of schools from all over the country, and actually globally, are now coming or inviting themselves along to see, <laughs> to see what we're doing. However, everybody asks, oh, Nikki, your school's brilliant at resilience and learning. How do you make them so resilient? And anyone who's a parent, and I'm a parent of a four and six-year-old, knows you can't make them do anything. <laughs> no way. So the reality of that is we always say it's not resilient in the learning. Resilience is learning. And if you can create adaptive learners who have that sense of determination and agency where they can do things for themselves, then anything is possible. One of the things I did when I first arrived was to think about how we could engage parents around well-being. So I bought 500 fridge magnets bit crazy. 500 fridge magnets 
and sent them out to every home in the community with a script. And the script was a bit like countering the old, what have you done at school today? Nothing. So we thought, we'll cultivate a language of learning around that, or well-being. And I was writing things like, perhaps you could say, did anybody do good work at your table today? And if so, did you tell them? Did you celebrate it? Or did you invite anybody to play a game who isn't playing already? Because that's inclusion. And if you didn't, why not? And the parents started to engage with that and start to support children to talk in a new way. And at the same time, parents started to talk to in a new way too. Within two years, we surveyed all our parents and 100% of our parents were using the school aims language in and out of school, which is pretty remarkable. So we were creating moral agents of change in every household. We were showing that there was a different way to communicate. There's an outstanding piece of research at the moment, which is by Peffer and Nettle, which talks about the behavioral constellations of deprivation. And essentially it talks about contextually anticipated behaviors for people living in deprivation, as complex and myriad as the night sky, and a very sober and somber read indeed. It talks about a phenomena called temporal discounting, where people literally trade away the future and make some questionable choices because, in the present, because they think, well, what's the point anyway? Why bother? Why take an interest in my child's education? Why choose a healthy option? Who knows what the future will bring? And that was a very somber read for all of us. So we had a determination to focus every single interaction we had with children on three things. Learn from the past, take ownership of the present, and create your future one decision at a time. And we were bringing conscientiousness in our school to the fore. And we did that by prioritizing well-being and protecting time to think about responsible, respected, included, all the different well-being indicators every day. There's an idea called path dependence. And essentially what it means is it's from Danish economists. And they looked at Roman roads from 2,000 years ago, and they mapped out the densest roads from those times. Then they took modern-day Europe and mapped those onto modern-day Europe. And the roads from Roman times 2,000 years ago mapped exactly onto the most prosperous parts of Europe today. Those pathways had stood the time or test of time 2,000 years later. So we had an idea about neurobiology that if we protected time internally, children could literally walk those paths to well-being by talking, thinking, modeling, respected, responsible, included every single day. And it's paying off. As you can see behind me, there is a whole host of interventions that we have been using successfully. We are one of the few schools in the country that report through the well-being outcomes. So traditional school reports are usually a big tomb of information. We, re we report through responsible, included, celebrated, in a way that supports parents to learn the language of well-being. And then we ask the parents as well. So if I'm saying to, in a report, your child's showing respect by, your child's learning about respect, I'll ask, are they doing it in the home? Because if they're not doing it in the home, then what we do is we identify a skills deficit and we work together with the parents to make sure that responsibility is shown at home and in school. And we can do things like prepare visuals. So for instance, if a child is struggling with transition but coping in school from going from one lesson to another, we will prepare and at home it's not working. So for instance, if you're brushing your teeth and you're going to bed and there's an absolutely holy meltdown, which happens in my house a lot, not from me, from my children. <laughs> what you've got is an opportunity to engage with parents and say, look, we'll create these visuals for you so your child can map out the evening and knows what's coming next, next to make it predictable for them. And parents have absolutely engaged with that because they see it as a relationship. And as we know, it's all about relation. We've also developed a new language around distress. And a lot of the time, 
I will, and my deputy sitting here in the audience today, Jackie, we will get phone calls from parents saying, come to my house and help us co-regulate. My child has just destroyed the bedroom, is re refusing to leave. And I've found myself on living room floors, in kitchens, in front rooms, because we have such a good relationship with the children in our school. And it's about modeling the type of behaviors that we would seek to create in others. So we do that. We also have a kind of phone service where parents phone me at quarter to eight in the morning, this is unofficial, <laughs> and ask, going to talk to Sarah, because she's kicking off and she's not coming into school today. And then, of course, I'm on the phone chatting to a child even before the school's begun over the phone. A bit unorthodox, but it's about regulation and anything we can do to support the children. There was a questionnaire I wrote again out to parents because I thought it would be quite provocative. And I said, how many of you think that we as a school are supporting your role as a parent? Really provocative because you're actually going into territory which is not really normal for schools to ask. 98% of our parents responded by saying that they felt we were actually supporting them as a parent, which is pretty unconventional but really reassuring for the direction of travel. <clears throat> we sent home five point scales so a child can regulate and know if they're one to a five and if there are three they walk away. We talked to parents about that. We sent home worry dolls, breathing beads. We run checkouts at the end of the day so we're handing our children back to and I'm saying our children because they are when they're in our school. We're just as much a part of the family as they are. We hand them back. We hand them back in a responsible way so the parents can get the best of them. We're not shaking them up like an iron brew bottle and saying, there you go. <laughs> we plan time so the child is calm and then we hand them across to the parent so the parent gets the best out of them. And that's really responsible and something that we are absolutely committed to do. We're one of the few schools in the country that actually plans for regulation, which basically means if you're going to give a child a really amazing learning experience and take them up to the heady heights and then wonder why they can't regulate and come back down, you have to have an exit strategy of calming activities to get them mellowed. Otherwise, the behavior will spike. So yes, we plan academically, but we also plan for regulation too. We do Tai Chi. I'm not going to do it. But we do Tai Chi at lunchtimes and staff, parents and children take part. We do yoga and we have children who are yoga ambassadors who go around showing other classes and other schools how to stretch. And it's really about taking control of their breathing. It was interesting because I think John, who was brilliant, this, really funny, really funny this morning, but very poignant as well, talked about hiding in plain sight. And we are trying to tune ourselves so we look for well-being in the gaze of a child, in the touch of a hand, in terms of a handshake or the warmth of an embrace. And there's lots of hugging going on in our school with the children and adults, not the adults. <laughs> and lots of modeling. Now, one way we actually model is by, essentially, even before the day starts, I will stand outside the school, which is literally 200 yards away from the school, and essentially just shake hands with every parent and grandparent and carer who comes in and all the children. <clears throat> and that essentially is what we would call relate, rupture and repair in absolute visual representation. Now Suzanne came in and did huge amounts of work with our staff and myself. And so we learn that at the moment I'm relating to you. Wait a minute. If I turn my back, then that would be rupture. And I'm repairing it because I'm looking at you again. Okay. Now, obviously there's more to it than that, but that's a basic principle. And resilience is created between the rupture and repair. And that's what we've taken at a very high level to parents and also to children about the way they interact and fall out. So by me standing outside and greeting all the parents as they come in and grandparents, no matter you know, what kind of day I'm having, I'm still out there morning and night, it's to show them that I am there to relate. It's all about relationship. Even before they get into the school, I am saying to them that you matter to me. 
and the staff model exactly the same behaviours. There was a very amusing story three weeks in where I was standing and a, uh, one of the grands came up and said, good morning, and I said, good morning. She went, good morning, I said, good morning. <laughs> and I turned to speak to somebody else and something happened. And I went, oh, play it cool, play it cool, Trig, what's going on? Went into the janitor's office and I was standing with a cup of coffee. I sieved out the cup of coffee and there was two pound coins in the bottom of it. She'd thought I was collecting for charity because <laughs> I was standing outside the gate and it was something that she hadn't seen before. So if she ever watches this talk, I've never seen her since, thank you for the two pounds. <laughs> so for us, one of the major points is children's voice. And we talk a lot about children's voice in schools about improvement, but we're looking at it from a perspective about worries. Because we know that worries are something that a child has to have the opportunity to share. So we run check-ins every single day. A check-in is basically how they're feeling. We do it first thing in the morning, after break, after lunch. We got rid of the bells. There are no bells in our school either because bells were stressing people out, which is quite interesting. There's an interesting short story, and I'll make it really quick, about dragons. And there's a wee boy, and he wakes up, and on the end of his bed, there's a, a wee dragon. And he shouts down to his mum and says, there's a dragon on the end of my bed. And the mum shouts up, there's no such thing as dragons. So the wee boy watches this dragon all night, and it gets bigger. And he can't sleep, so he wakes up in the morning, goes down to have his breakfast. The dragon eats all his breakfast. He says, mum, the dragon's eating all my breakfast. She says, there's no such thing as a dragon. So he goes to school hungry. He sits and watches this dragon all day, sitting in the corner of the room. And of course, he doesn't do any schoolwork. He goes home, and the dragon at this time is getting bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where it consumes the whole house. The dad comes home from work and says, what's going on here? Where's the house gone? Because the dragon's moved it down the road. And mum says, well, maybe there is a dragon. And as soon as she says that, the dragon shrinks back down to size. Now, I told that story at assembly, and every single child got it from, from the age of about four or five up, because they understand that one of the big things that they want is the ability to share their worries with people in a very considered and compassionate way. And that's so important for schools to build in time where they can talk to children in a very relaxed way about, okay, let's try and reframe that, or if there's something I can do to help you, I'm absolutely going to do that. I don't know why, because it's down here, so it's fine. <laughs> there's a flower which is our school aims, which is the well-being indicators. And in the middle of that flower is the words grit. Because when I came into the school, we had two things going on. Some people were using Carol Dweck, which was growth mindset, which is about fixed intelligence, and that's great. But there was a parallel stream going on from Penn State University, which was grit. People who have grit are more successful in life. And grit is basically passion and perseverance for long-term goals. So I sat on my daughter's bed and tried to work out how I could translate that in a simple way so children in the nursery could get it. So we came up with get really into trying. And it's something that is our core value, that you can bring effort to anything at all. It's a non-negotiable, you bring effort. It's kind of like the Kaizen philosophy, if you're gonna make a cup of tea, you make it the best possible cup of tea. So in our school, no wonder the inspectors came away thinking, these children are absolutely committed to doing their best in every single interaction. And that's from a well-being perspective too. High degrees of empathy, extreme care and consideration shown. So whilst that idea seemed a very plausible one, there was a wee fella in the nursery who was building what can only be described as a Russian, or sorry, a Roman Colosseum with Lego bricks. And he was at it for about four days. And he was actually worrying some of the staff in the nursery because the tongue was out and it was, he wasn't drinking, he wasn't a snack, nothing. So one of the ladies went across and said, Archie, give it up. And he went, no. <laughs> so she left it five minutes, she went back again and said, Archie, give it up. It's coming towards home time. And he turned around and went, Mr. Murray says, I have to get a grip. <laughs> and she said, no, it's grit, not grip. So one little thing I'd like to touch on is about ACEs. 
and poverty. And we know about poverty in our context. We started a food bank, which essentially was an idea to ensure that we had the means to provide families who were in crisis with food. And then it extended to clothing, and we had thousands of pounds worth of winter jackets that we handed out, and then extended to essentially ensuring that we had presents for every child at Christmas too. Now, as we went around delivering, <laughs> thank you, but as we went around delivering to all the homes in the community, it was really interesting because my father had said, you better watch what you're doing because that might not be taken the right way. And as my little daughter would say, there was a lot of happy crying, Daddy, because people were overwhelmed. And it was probably the most satisfying um, episode for, for myself and my staff because it was so rewarding to give people what they needed when they needed it. We also think about the children because I know as well, I'd listened to a podcast by Chris uh, Kilkenny and Suzanne and uh, John Corcoran, and they talked about hunger being an ace. And it was very interesting because that was our idea as well, that we would create a second breakfast for every child. So literally, we feed hundreds of children every day by the generosity of our community and some of our parent group uh, fundraising to ensure that any child comes to our school gets a second breakfast to ensure that they are eating and they are fed. And that's so, so important for schools to think about that. We started a resilience framework, which I hope schools start to look at, which was based on the work of the Robert Johnson Foundation, and it was called Near Science. And I liked that word because it was neuroscience, epigenetics, adversity, and resilience. And I didn't know what epigenetics were. And I wasn't going to be standing at the gate talking about epigenetics. <laughs> so I changed it to near and far, which was neuroscience, early intervention, attainment, resilience, families, adversity, and relationships. And we then had outcome measures for each of those different work streams to ensure that our work was manageable. And that has literally transformed the way that we are able to reach and support children and families. And as you can see from the quote, her Majesty's Inspectorate don't write that very often, but demonstrating exceptional care and concern for children and families in a very structured way. The final thoughts are, my mum was an educator as well. She was married, well, obviously she was married to my father, but she was married to my father, and my father was a successful professional football player called Steve Murray, who played for Glasgow Celtic and Aberdeen and Dundee and a few other teams. And he lived in poverty, extreme poverty in Dumbarton. And he went through to Dundee to try his luck and he made it into the first team when he was 16 years old. And one of the most important things that he did, which he tells me, is that because his, his family was brought up in poverty, he made an absolute determination that none of his family would have to continue down that route. So as soon as he got into the first team at 16, he was the youngest captain in Dundee's history when he was 20, he started to save money from his football wage so that he could buy properties through in Dundee, little flats or deposits on them, so he could bring his whole family from, it was like little Dumbarton. <laughs> and he brought them all through to Dundee so he could support them financially and try and stop or interrupt that cycle of poverty. And as a result of doing that, he obviously has created a real sense of determination on my part that I would be committed to helping people who are less fortunate than myself. My mum, because she was mar married to a successful athlete, she didn't need to work at all. But she chose to be a teacher in the most deprived area of Dundee for 25 years. And she got it. She understood what the impact of a significant adult, no matter what happened, she was assaulted, she was punched, she was kicked, she was beaten, and that was hard for me and my brothers to take, seeing my mum coming in, you know, wearing lots of scars and whatnot, and we, were absolutely amazed at the dignity and courage and the fact that she got relate rupture and repair at such a very deep level that she turned up every day for 25 years, even to the point where she had cancer and she continued working. She had her own food bank and clothing bank going on. Me and my brothers would sit in the car on a Friday night and she would deliver discreetly food parcels to people after the school day. She had a clothing bank going on as well and me and my brothers were brilliant at let it go before it was in fashion. 
I would get a jacket and I was like, oh, this is a business, loving it. And then my mum would, after a month, I'd say, where's my jacket, mum? She'd be like, ah, oh, you didn't need that, Nicky. Didn't need that. <laughs> and then she'd the goal to go around saying, oh, Nicky, bra lad, give you the shirt off his back. <laughs> I never had a choice, did I? <laughs> so I also think that bereavement's a, an ace as well, because we deal with lots of bereavement in our school. And I actually started at Burnside two days after my mother had passed away. And that was really difficult for me to assume that leadership responsibility and stand at the gate two days after my mum had passed away. But I thought I'll be a little bit more like her and try and model what she would expect of me. So one of the things she constantly said was, Nikki, all through your life, you're going to get people saying, schools can only do so much. You can only do so, so much. And she said, don't believe it because that's a lie. If you get rid of the only, the truth will out. Schools can do so much. You can do so much. So I'd like to say thank you very much for sharing a little of our, a little of our story with you today and a little of the song that my mother taught me. So thank you very, very much.